We've seen so many games lately that aim to recapture the spirit of an era. No, we're not referring to the sizable number of reboots, remakes, and reimaginings spilled out by some of the larger studios lately, although to be fair, some of those are quite good. We're talking instead about games that try their hardest to reproduce those bumpy rough titles of the 80s and 90s. They weren't always timeless classics, but often were more like the awkward teenage years of the games industry. Experiences that were full of imagination and ambition, but tragically constrained by the technology of the times. They're the gaming equivalent to a cassette tape, spooling away quietly on a time-yellowed boombox in the bedrooms of covetous collectors and largely ignored in a world ruled by Spotify. Games in this newly formed niche strive to be warts and all experiences that wield the mighty power of nostalgia. But what's good for the connoisseur is doubly good for us, and today we found a brand new game that encapsulates the design, controls, gameplay, and presentation of the CD-ROM era circa 1995. Hand of Doom is a first-person dark comedy wizard adventure, developed by Torpal Duke and published by DreadXP. Initially, this game was released in a much more stripped-down and basic version as part of the DreadX collection. These curated collections of short, experimental horror games are developed by a wide range of small indie teams and have gained a decent amount of notoriety in the indie horror scene. This is where I first experienced the rudimentary release of Hand of Doom, and if you're interested, you can too. This version's still available in the first Dread X collection or on the developer's itch page for a couple of bucks. However, the new and vastly improved version of Hand of Doom has finally hit the virtual store shelves and you'd be hard-pressed to find a more faithful representation of the height of the CD-ROM's popularity. It's filled with the full-motion video sequences and period faithful voice acting common to the era. Ah, a sword. <laughs> <laughs> when developers were determined to make games more like movies and pack all that new disc storage space with grainy video and scratchy voiceovers. There's a keyboard spanning control scheme that harkens back to a time when 3D games were still taking their first stumbly baby toddler steps into the industry. The interface is filled with unnecessary animated flourishes and greebles, taking up nearly half of the screen real estate. Crunchy first person animations trigger when using spells and weapons, and it's a truly amazing level of era accuracy. If this game was arrested for committing a crime in a neighborhood populated by old MS-DOS games, this one would be nearly impossible to pick out of a lineup. Gameplay in Hand of Doom is performed with a combination of cursor point and clicking and keyboard 3D movement. This is a combo which feels incredibly clunky by today's standards, but was a surprisingly popular scheme for the time frame Hand of Doom takes inspiration from. Many old first-person dungeon crawlers, such as Daggerfall, Lands of Lore 2, and Shadowcaster, used a similar scheme. To offset the slow, methodical movement and controls, enemies also move slowly and often provide large attack telegraphs. Combat is still fairly simplistic, and it's possible to stunlock most of the enemies once you get your hands on a better weapon, which can make it feel a little bit trivial, unless you find yourself surrounded. Magical combat is a bit different. The slower pace means you must mentally measure your opponent's distance and movements while you're casting your spells to avoid taking damage, flailing your fingers around, both in the game and on the mouse. There's no aiming reticule of any kind, so clom... clombat. Mortal clombat! <laughs> There's no aiming reticule of any kind, so combat is mostly close range, but there were more than a few opportunities to snipe some unaware monsters by being careful and patient. Death comes to us all, and wizards are no exception. Falling in combat results in this lovable animation, which is definitely not a Dark Souls reference, before you're kicked back to the latest checkpoint. Wait, checkpoint? That's right, not even the most powerful wizards in Hand of Doom have mastered the ancient art of the SAVE SKULL! Not everything you'll find throughout the pocket dimensions will try to murder your magician. During your exploits, you'll run across many a wizard with a tale to tell. Some of these conversations with your fellow conjurers will provide you with useful clues, or even new spell recipes, but most are just goofy throwaway gags and wizard puns, which honestly are all pretty silly and great. And then I told him, Ort, no way! <laughs> Eternal. <laughs> 
I kind of feel like these are the heart of the game, honestly. I mean, the real juice of this game is like a green screen in my bedroom kind of thing, and then make sprites out of it and, and populate a world. Yeah, I mean, it's just like a long line of wizard puns and jokes, and honestly, I'm really here for it. Plus, I mean, it's got the nostalgia factor coming out the ass. It's great. And, and the fact that the main category of character is one that it thematically makes sense to drape with a bunch of robes, like dark robes and no face, means that they can uh, very smartly you know, make one sprite for a huge host of characters and then just, you know, use their buddies to do some voiceover work. Yep. <laughs> All right, you got the spell. Now blow me. Ift, ift, ork. Bye. <laughs> point and click puzzling is a large portion of the game it's pretty much the whole game and this is accomplished either with basic inventory puzzles or with the spell casting system inventory puzzles tend to be more of the find the key and bring it back variety in classic 90s design style there's very little hand holding and a decent amount of backtracking and explorations required for these object hunts sometimes a spell would be needed to defeat an obstacle or fulfill a particular condition for example, the rain spell is needed several times to extinguish some burning trees. Or later on, some burning wizards. The spells are governed by combinations of runes, which lie on the right side of the interface. Spellcasting works like this. You click on the runes in the desired order, hit the encant button, and your wizard yells, <laughs> while your little fingers waggle and waggle around in the view screen. If you did it right, your spell effect poots forth into the viewing window. It feels a little goofy, but it simply begs for experimentation, as any new spells you discover are added to your grimoire for later reference. This mechanic might be a little bit slower than just picking a spell off of a menu and hitting the fire button, but it's way more fun and definitely feels more wizardly. We did find ourselves having to pour over the grimoire fairly often to remember how to cast some of the more complex combinations. Like, any combination that requires more than two runes, basically. Uh, which probably speaks more about our mental capacity than about the game. But, this inconvenient and methodical approach is ultimately just one more thing in a long line of features that makes Hand of Doom feel right at home amongst the retro RPGs of old. All of this together makes for an authentic experience right down to the joys and the frustrations of the ancient games it emulates. The other thing that it does just on, uh, kind of regarding the game on its own merits and not within the context of game history is it makes you feel more like a wizard, right? Like we think of wizards as needing these spell books, needing to do research, needing to take their time and approach problems methodically instead of jumping in and hacking at it with a sword. Although you can do that too. But I mean, Gandalf had a sword. Oh yeah, Gandalf had a sword. Just, just in case. Gandalf had a sword, so screw it. I can have a sword. I'm a wizard with a sword. Hand of Doom goes out of its way to look like a product out of time, and once again, the devil's in the details. Even putting aside the interface and the wonderfully cheesy FMV sequences, which we can't praise highly enough, the game's environments have an excellent atmosphere. Giant set pieces like the looming castle in the intro, or this awesome tornado, bring the world to life. Whoa, you didn't see the big tornado. Wow. While little touches like the water reflections or subtle area lighting fill in the details. Color is put into good use in the game's large variety of biomes, and a generous amount of different billboarded sprites mix with low poly props to help stylistically set each world apart. The denizens of the realm are lovingly rendered with a good amount of sprite rotation and multiple viewing angles, and some well done yet period appropriate animations. And what would Hand of Doom be without the hands? Every spell and weapon your enchanter wields has an accompanying first-person FMV animation. The map, the quest log, and the spell book are all combined into one massive book, the Grimoire, which also functions as kind of an eidetic interface element. These little touches pull the whole experience straight into the dimension of 90s nerd nostalgia. When confronted with some speech, the dialogue pop-ups all have a goofy, charming style that emulates early photobash. And each one of these is accompanied with the deliberate wooden voice acting style that was so common in the early CD-ROM era. I'm impressed with the attention to detail here. 
Voice lines are dirty sounding, compressed and noisy, as if recorded through a cheap microphone in a room full of fans before being pitch shifted to sound more spooky and monstrous. So remember, if someone gets in your face, don't be afraid to cast fist. <laughs> That's a wizard joke. This is just so absolutely on brand for early games that embrace CD-ROM technology when developers just wanted to fill the space on disc without regard for quality. And I love this touch. Likewise, the soundtrack completely slaps. It's a booming, heavy mix of doom metal guitar riffs and dungeon synth that would be right at home in the stereo of someone's conversion van as they rip killer clouds in a remote parking lot after their pizza delivery shift. This game rocks! Since this is a brand new game, we'll try to keep the story as spoiler-free as possible. Just be warned that there are some minor spoilers ahead, so if you wish to experience it all for yourself, skip to here. The game opens with a brief, dreamlike sequence. Your unnamed protagonist arrives by carriage at the base of a mysterious tower. The tower's blue flames flicker ominously in the night air as the PNG forest looms into view, and you make your way through an overgrown garden. A decrepit gate falls easily before your mighty fist. Bonk. I'm a mighty wizard. And after a short journey down the downtrodden path, the tower's entrance reveals itself in the darkness. You steal yourself and slip through the massive door, only to find yourself face to face with the Wizard King himself. The King of Wizards presents a yellowed parchment, to which you eagerly sign your squiggly signature, giddy with the promise of power. The room grows dark, your senses fail, you slip into blackness and awaken in a musty library. You slowly realize all of this was no dream. It was a memory. You're now irrevocably bound to the Wizard King's service. He tasks you, the lowliest of his acolytes, to succeed where all others have failed and locate the 13 black relics of arcane power. In doing so, you will prove yourself worthy to become apprentice to the Wizard King and join the Black Order. It does not make a lot of sense that he would send his worst acolyte to do this, but hey, who am I to question the Wizard King? I mean, he says that he sent everybody else first, but then what are all of these folks doing here? It feels like they didn't try very hard and they were just like, well, gotta, gotta send the new guy, I guess. Maybe he could do it, you know? Your first order of business is to leave the tower, find your grimoire, and kill the Lord of Druids. As you explore the dark woods, many of your fellow wizards tell tales of the Wizard King's cruelty and disregard for the lives of his disciples. Other wizard wannabes have been repaid for their loyalty with death, disintegration, or even eternal torture. So is serving the king really in your best interest? Uh, well, no, it's not. Marching further through the dark woods, you continue to grow your magic talents and learn that the druids are locked in a bitter struggle with the forces of the wizard king over the destruction of the forest. After earning the favor of a witch who removes a horde of druids from your path in return for your help completing a potion, you find yourself locked in a trial of combat with the mighty lord of the druids. A walking tree. One complicated lumberjack move later, the Lord of Druids pledges to help overthrow the evil reign of the Wizard King if ever the opportunity should present itself. The Treebeard goes on to encourage you to seek out and recruit the other Doom Lords in order to facilitate some sort of Avengers Assemble style showdown against the Wizard King. Seeing as your choices may now boil down to overthrow the Wizard King or get disintegrated, this seems to be a matter of basic survival. So as your wizardly batteries get all fucking juiced up, will your loyalty to the Wizard King and the Black Order remain intact? Or will you attempt to topple his reign and snatch the secrets of the Black Order for yourself? Hand of Doom would have been completely cutting edge in the mid-90s, and it's not too hard to imagine this game featured as the center spread in an ancient PC gamer issue. There's a good amount of fun to be had, wizard jokes to groan and giggle at, and secrets to uncover over the game's six to eight hour runtime. It's a high recommendation from us, but only if you're the certain type of player that is willing to embrace its intent and enjoy it as an homage to the obscure cultural artifacts of PC gaming's past. Plus, for a game that provides this much entertainment in a time capsule of bygone gaming, the price is definitely right. Thanks for sticking around as we uncover this occult tale of spells and silliness. If you want to support us in our never-ending quest to conjure content, 
please consider joining our brand new Patreon page, becoming a channel member, or tipping us on Ko-Fi. Or if you can't support us with your dollars, it always helps to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and let us know how you think we're doing. Or how you're doing. How you doing out there? Hey, how you doing? Due to the poll results, the next video is probably actually going to be Hammer and Sickle. Which we're going to dig into as soon as I can get it working properly. But it's coming, along with some other stuff. So, thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next Two-Headed Hero. What? You're still here? Go away!